Hello and welcome to today's webinar, the SDO World Server Quarterly Showcase, The Future. My name's Kate and I'll be your host today. Um, today's speaker is Ray Hopley, who's a Product Management Director for SDL World Server, and we expect that today's webinar will last around 30 to 35 minutes, followed by a Q&A session. If you do have any questions throughout this webinar, then please put them in the Q&A box in the Ask a Question tab. I'll now pass you over to Ray to begin the presentation. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction, Kate, and welcome everybody to this quarter's uh, World Server Showcase webinar. Um, if you've joined the previous uh, instances of this webinar, you'll know that I often talk about product features and uh, some kind of show and tell about how to leverage those features uh, for particular production requirements that you might have. Today, the topic is slightly different, and I wanted to talk a little bit today about the future of um, SDL World Server and the roadmap that we have. And it's primarily in the context of some recent announcements that you may have heard from SDL related to uh, our language cloud uh, technology we have. Provide some reassurance about the future longevity of the World Server as a product to make sure uh, that you understand where it fits into our overall language technology strategy and the broader portfolio. And I will talk a little bit about what the SDL Language Cloud is as well, just to clarify for people in case uh, there's some detail missing from the messages you may have heard already. And then I will uh, present the roadmap uh, for World Server for the next couple of releases going into uh, the end of 2020, so next year. And then we'll take some Q&A, should there be any. I imagine there will. Okay. So about SDL's language technology uh, strategy, <clears throat> excuse me. So we have many TMSs in our portfolio, and you'll be aware uh, that you know, this is all for historical reasons. They uh, all have been providing business, considerable business value in the globalization space for many, many enterprises for a number of years. Um, obviously, World Server is one of them. There are others, as they're listed out here, most recently added to our portfolio with a Donnelly acquisition, and we have SDL Multitrans, and people always ask, of course, that age-old question, why do we have so many? Uh, the reason is primarily for the kind of growth through acquisition that SDL has undertaken over the years in the technology space. Um, but there is some very clear differentiation between uh, those TMSs. And just a very, very brief summary about how we uh, segment them. Um, so World Server is primarily on-premise. Uh, it has a very rich set of APIs, flexible workflow, lots of other uh, unique characteristics, but obviously in a one-slide uh, presentation, that's not going to uh, do it justice. But this is kind of a summary of the differentiation that we make. So Translation Management System, uh, TMS, is um, has then a parallel a kind of product and offering, what's often called mantras or managed translation. This is primarily aimed at uh, those customers who require a TMS but are also uh, utilizing uh, SEL's language services offering. Uh, we have Trados Group Share. This is really about a collaboration uh, tool. This is about sharing translation memories and term bases in real time for the linguists. It has some uh, project management capabilities, but it has no real workflow uh, engine behind it uh, currently, for example, and only recently required reporting some of these kind of enterprise level capabilities. But indeed, there is a market segment that requires this light touch project management and real time collaboration. Then we have Multitrans, as I mentioned. This is primarily focused on the regulated industries. Uh, there's a, a very detailed audit trail capability there that lends itself to that kind of requirement. So a very, br very brief brief summary and not exhaustive by any means uh, differentiation between our various TMS products. But indeed, there is still uh, a lot of overlap between the capabilities they offer. These are really kind of specializations that we're talking about here in order to achieve that differentiation. What really they're made up of is a set of capabilities. And yes, each of those uh, tools implements its own variation for historical reasons of variation. And what we have been doing for the last few years, and uh, you'll know this if you've heard some of my previous uh, broadcasts, um, the convergence theme. So we have aligned a number of the 
uh, core underlying technologies, the file filtering, for example, that's the kind of classic example. That's the same across all of the entire product suite, including Multitrans, our most recent acquisition. We've been in World Server for 10 years and uh, TMS for about the same amount of time, uh, Studio Group Share, all aligned on the single set of file filtering capabilities. We do have some differences in TM and, and how that works. So uniquely, uh, World Server has segment ID matching capabilities, for example, and that kind of differentiates it. That really speaks to the software localization use case, but others too. And so there are some differences and details uh, that will underpin those differences. But really, when we want to abstract it, what are the core capabilities of ATMS is what's shown on the screen here. We have co content owners who are making translation requests. We have a manager who's in the middle who's managing the execution of that localization request. We have the linguists who are actually performing the work of the call face here, doing the actual translating and the reviewing. And then underneath all of that, we have the supporting technologies. We have the workflow that tracks the execution. We have terminology and TM feeding into the editing piece, uh, also feeding into the billing and costing, for example, and the vendor management. So all of these pieces tied together. So this is really kind of an, uh, uh, kind of architecture kind of slide representation, the core capabilities in an abstract uh, view of what underpins each of the TMSs that we have. And then if I move on to what's, the, what's new with uh, SDL Language Cloud, so it's the concretization of that kind of converged vision. It's a single uh, set of core technologies that we uh, have been developing. So it's not only taking the an individual workflow engine from World Server and the TM from Group Share, but it's actually analyzing the capabilities in detail, figuring out the superset that we want to offer of all of those capabilities and implementing that in a microservice-led architecture. But it's also underpinned, and the key differentiator, and certainly from uh, some of the messaging that you all have heard, is around the linguistic AI capabilities. So in the first instance, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, we've got some examples when we come into um, a little bit more detail around what the language cloud will be when it's launched in a couple of weeks. Uh, so neural machine translation is in there and this translation analysis, and I'll talk about what that means in a moment. But that's really, it's the same set of core capabilities. It's the superset of all of the uh, technologies that are in the current portfolio, and it has this extra AI layer uh, underpinning it as well. So just to go into some of the detail, this is a very similar diagram uh, that I took from a language cloud marketing deck. So you'll see the same. You have the content owners, the project managers, the linguists. You have terminology management. You have TM and workflow and all of those other things. A couple of the differentiators here, uh, there are three uh, primarily. There's the content analyzer, which is the beginning of our AI journey. Um, there's Neural MT, which is somehow AI related, some of the uh, clever underpinnings of how we got to the uh, huge kind of quantum leap in quality of output of MT through neural technologies is based on similar principles to the AI. And then we have enterprise ready as cloud and it's cloud only and that is another one of the key differentiators. And certainly for uh, SDL World Server customers, that may present a difference to the current implementation deployment model, which is often on-premise, not exclusively, um, but often on-premise. So this is uh, one of the key differences in, uh, you know, for my audience today is it's cloud only. There is only one. It's not um, like deploying an instance of software for me. I have my tenant within the single cloud infrastructure, and it's, uh, you know, it's a simplified deployment model from the customer's perspective because you have SDL uh, doing all of the uh, hosting and maintenance and upgrades and everything else that will happen seamlessly. So that's one of the key points to stress here. Uh, the other two I mentioned are around the AI story that we have for our language cloud. So I move on. So this is really, as it states there, the next generation of language technology it's a platform that provides these capabilities, as I've tried to describe. And we have our first release uh, going uh, out in a couple of weeks. There was a marketing launch uh, earlier in the summer and then uh, some more activity. You may have uh, subscribed to those mails or those announcements. And obviously, we're ramping up towards the big launch in uh, towards the end of September. It's called Venus there. That's an internal code name we uh, adopted 
a kind of space solar system theme for the different kind of milestones for how we got there. So the next one will be Earth, of course, and then we'll move through the planets. That feeds into some of the slide artwork that you'll see. Looks a bit spacey, but that's kind of an internal way for us to track the different milestones, as I said, uh, towards getting that product out to market. So as you see here, availability of language cloud. There's some very important uh, points on, on this slide, so I'll dwell on it a little bit. As I mentioned, marketing launch was back in June. Um, public availability will be in a couple of weeks, so we commence on the 16th of September, so imminent. And who are we targeting? So primarily, the focus is only on new customers. So there's very good reasons for this, and I'll explain that That's in the second part. So obviously localization buying centers and localization managers are two of the key uh, buying personas that we're targeting. Um, but ju just to stress again, it's for new customers. And the messaging for you and for all of our existing customers on all of those other products that I was talking about that we have in the TMS portfolio is that nothing changes for you. In uh, for the rest of this year and into next year. We continue and are committed uh, to continue to develop, support, and maintain the existing portfolio of TMS products that we have. So the outreach by the end of 2019, it says this meeting, the, this presentation that I'm giving today is one example of that customer outreach. And I'm talking to you about the timeline for the existing products. So that you'll see in the roadmap there is no change. We still have our dedicated engineering team. We are still consuming those converged core components. We are delivering innovation and productivity enhancements for all of our user personas. And you'll see some of the detail of how we're achieving that when I get to the roadmap section. But that's, I want that message to be very clear and unambiguous that nothing changes for you uh, with the launch of SDL Language Cloud. I mean, there are some reasons for that uh, as a f version one, although it's cloud and we can incrementally deliver on this and we'll continue, uh, like have that continuous kind of delivery model where upgrades are seamless and new features appear. Um, with that model, uh, you know, we still won't be in a position, for example, to have full feature parity with uh, a mature and well-developed product like SDL World Server, for example. So there's some obvious reasons why it wouldn't be a migration target. Uh, it's no small undertaking to do that. So the availability of a release for a possible transition to language cloud is something that you will start seeing more meaningfully for you in your context of your own implementation of World Server as we go through 2020. And it could well be that there are certain capabilities that you rely on that will not be in the language cloud even in the first half of next year and maybe uh, potentially second half of next year. But uh, another thing that I want to stress is that as well as my roadmap for World Server, I also have to bear in mind and I have some responsibility uh, for the definition of what language cloud is, i.e. Uh, feeding into that roadmap. And some of the features and capabilities that I know you rely on, we can prioritize in the language cloud delivery based on the fact that we want to get into a position where we can enable that kind of transition uh, to the SDR Language Cloud platform, should it be appealing to you and should it fit your own, uh, not only business requirements from a localization perspective, but also IT ownership requirements in terms of uh, there are many good uh, use cases where the technology that's underpinning your localization needs to remain behind the firewall that you own that uh, uh, kind of the IT footprint, and that's perfectly fine, but that means that SEO Language Cloud is probably not going to suit your needs. Cloud has been a buzzword for a few years now. It's kind of settled down in terms of the uh, concerns that people have expressed related to things like security and, uh, you know, where is my data located, geolocated, for example. We've got good answers to all of those questions. But if the ultimate uh, decision for your enterprise is that it stays behind our firewall, then, uh, then SDL language cloud transition is not available to you. But I expect that the vast majority of our uh, enterprise deployments, not only well so, but also the other tools that I was talking about, should have a target version of language cloud that they can migrate to, uh, that, you know, the possibly migrate to within the next 18 uh, to 24 months. That is the goal that we have for our kind of development execution. Back to the summary of the message, nothing changes 
in those 18 months for you and we continue to deliver on the world server roadmap but just to flesh out the picture a little more around uh, what language cloud is so here complete content in integration this is the goal it has an, our neural machine translation natively baked in for example uh, it's persona driven what we call intelligent translation management. I'll talk a little bit about how, how you'll see that in the first instance, and it's kind of baby steps along that journey, the AI journey, as I call it, and I'll describe a little bit more about that. And then 100% Trados compatible. There have been along uh, the way some frictions between the existing enterprise tools and our flagship uh, translation productivity tool, Travis Studio, and all of those have gone away because, as I mentioned at the beginning, in terms of how we were going about gathering the technology and extrapolating the core pieces of that, the, it has to be a seamless supply chain uh, story, and that's underpinned by the technology. So that's some uh, small advantages there for you if you were suffering from some of those pains. So SDL language cloud, I'm just going to forward a little bit. It's highly automated. Obviously, that's key. That's the real kind of uh, one of the uh, engines of the globalization for you know large enterprises is the workflow automation, the process automation, and the kind of hands-off approach to uh, localization management. AI-driven, and I'll talk a little bit more about that, showing a, a concrete example that you'll see in the initial version. It's built for scale. Obviously, as I mentioned, it's uh, a single instance of a cloud product. Obviously, it's architected uh, using microservices and all of the other uh, cloud uh, kind of architectural underpinnings that we require for this uh, level of offering now, because if we imagine the 100 TMSs and the 100 world servers and the 100 multitrans is all on the same uh, set of infrastructure, then it needs to be built for scale, and that's been uh, baked in from the uh, very beginning of the design, and easy to use interface. Uh, as legacy products or you know the existing portfolio, they look a little bit, uh, I guess, Older, there are new UI paradigms and user experience paradigms that we're able to more easily develop. Uh, we've done some very good work in the last few years on uh, world server UI and user experience. It's a continued area of focus for us, as you'll see when I go through the roadmap. But from uh, the very beginning, since this is a kind of the UI layer on top of those existing and extended capabilities that we have, uh, it was much easier for us to uh, develop uh, that more modern look and feel for the application. And it addresses all of the personas. This is the goal from the content owner, like I said, to the localization manager, to the linguists, to the individual project managers, uh, managing projects. And uh, we focus on uh, all of those personas as we do across the supply chain. And here is some examples. I'm not sure how well you can see the differentiation, but for content owners, they get a tracking uh, screen so you can see your list of active projects, individual breakdowns of uh, progress. Localization managers get a, a much richer view. They have this kind of heat map, and uh, I'll show you that in a second. Then the translators, obviously, you can see the online editor here. So that is the kind of online uh, translation and reviewing capability. Again, we've seen this surfaced in multiple products already. It's in TMS, it's in World Server, it's in Group Share, and here it is again. Uh, offering the very rich translation and review capabilities online uh, for the language cloud. So again, uh, we, we class this as next generation, and, but the existing products are also benefiting from it. But here you'll see this is a, partly uh, the reason we were building it in such a way, a universal way, we used to call it universal editor, so that it can be spread across multiple uh, products. So here is the localization manager view. Uh, we've gone, obviously, for a very rich uh, visual graphical uh, view here. That heat map is glowing red for projects where tasks are overdue. It's glowing amber uh, where a task is approaching its workflow step deadline, for example, and green is where everything's running along smoothly. One of the things that we wanted to do with the uh, project manager persona here is um, take advantage, more advantage of the automation uh, that underpins all of these tools and have them managed by exception. 
So you should only really be focusing on the things that uh, require your attention where something is not going to the project plan. And that uh, nice simple color scheme is, is supposed to help you with that. Obviously, you drill down, you double click, and these represent individual, um, what you call in the world server context, clients. Uh, each of those represents the projects for an individual client. You can double click and drill in and you get uh, you know, the individual breakdown for the tasks that are in a particular state, are they overdue or they're in an error state, for example, um, still happens. Um, so that, that's the kind of uh, approach we're taking with that graphical view. Again, a more graphical view of the progress of an individual project through a workflow, this nice Kanban view. Um, has resonated very well with the uh, users that we've already been socializing these designs and implementation with. So this is the kind of uh, breakdown of an individual project so you can see the different workflow steps that the different tasks are at. And here is the uh, output of the SDL content analyzer. So the AI journey, like I said, starts uh, with this and continues on and it's really about aggregating and gathering a, enough data to then develop that AI technology into a decision-making agent uh, that makes automated decisions or even recommendations to a human uh, about how to deal with individual projects, uh, parameters and characteristics. So what this the content analyzer does, it uh, basically sniffs through the source content that you're submitting it provides some domain analysis, as you can see in the top. It identifies named entities and then individual keywords in some kind of automated uh, taxonomy extraction uh, mode. So this is just an example of where we're starting. So really the key feature of AI is, yes, some very clever algorithms, but an enormous amount of data, and data that is marked up in such a way that a machine can understand what makes one piece of data different from another and then aggregating that, analyzing it, and being able to draw and identify patterns from that data, and then use those patterns to feed into the clever algorithms to say that, um, just to give you a kind of futuristic example, so this is not in the version one, but once I have gathered some data around the project execution, and I know that the QA checks that I run in the online editor uh, are showing me that there are more often uh, terminology issues with Spanish translator, but only typically when we use this vendor, then you'll be able to make decisions and uh, assignment decisions when you when a new project is created, a project manager can use that data and the prompts from the AI engine within to either manually route it to another translator or simply do something like you know, refresh the terminology so that, that vendor knows that they need to update their uh, local term base or whatever it might be but that's the idea right that we start with content analysis we start with uh, project execution and workflow analysis so that we can understand the patterns that are being exhibited across the localization flow and from there derive insights that can then uh, feed into project management decisions with the ultimate goal of having automated uh, workflow routing and you know other kinds of uh, decisions made by the machine. That's why we have it as machine first. Like I said, uh, that's kind of that's where we're going with that AI journey, and the initial implementation will include this content analysis piece uh, as part of your workflow execution. Okay, so that was all about language cloud, and obviously it's kind of there's some very exciting things there and very interesting things, and I just tried to. Uh, show the evolution of our existing technology stack, which benefits from some of the developments that were uh, actually targeted at the Language Cloud platform, things like the online editor. Um, there are some other differences, of course, uh, where things like the workflow engine that we're using is actually a third-party tool. It's, a, it's not the same as the workflow engine in any of our existing tools. But, for example, we have remained aligned and we try to remain converged. So in the World Server context, with 11.4, our most recent release, we uh, introduced a replacement for the old applet. So it's now uh, a very nice non-applet uh, workflow editor, which is obviously uh, the look and feel is a lot more modern, the floating palette and all of those things that users like. Uh, looks really good. Only positive feedback about that. If you have diverging opinions, I would love to hear them, but it resonates very well. 
but the, the point, my point here is that it uses the same technology uh, as based on an, an engine um, called Kamunda, which is a third-party workflow execution tool, and we're using the same component for our world server workflow. So the kind of technology convergence covers a number of things. It's utilizing our own uh, kind of linguistic processing tools across the portfolio. It's aligning some of the behaviors so that they are, uh, you know, that the different tools behave the same way, even if the implementation is specific to that tool. But it's also uh, extending out the capabilities that we're delivering in Language Cloud and using some of the uh, supporting technologies to enrich our existing tools. And we did that with that workflow editor piece. But just as a summary here of the most recent release, 11.4, I'll just kind of summarize it. Huge focus on the new user interface. We've had um, performance improvements on those uh, projects and task pages. We've had new functionality. We've had the single sign-on framework implemented in the new login page as a big area of focus for us, as you can see. So performance in general, also the API performance, or rather the TM provider performance was improved by using our new API uh, rather than the old legacy SOAP web services. And uh, there's a couple of other standard pieces here. We always update the file type support, and we will always update the online editor piece to benefit from new functionality. And there's a little bit more detail to come on that. But those are examples of those core components, the capabilities that underpin the platform uh, of Language Cloud and the existing portfolio of products that we continue to keep up to date. So we're always benefiting from innovation in those areas. Okay, just a couple of examples. I don't really need to dwell on those. I think you've seen them in previous presentations. So uh, this is updating the source file. This is a feature that you can expose through the UI and the API to support the continuous localization flow. And then we have an example of a very simple workflow, but in the new editor, just to show you that again. And this is the same, like I said, the same component that will be used to ultimately build the language cloud workflows. And then, so that was a small recap. Our next release is going to be World Server 11.5. Uh, this, uh, I have committed that we will ship this by the end of this year. And you'll see there's a couple of important things that we need to do. Um, the Java world is getting very fragmented since Oracle introduced uh, pricing for using their JDK. So that's SDL as a software development company using the JDK to develop software, in this case, World Server. Uh, they wanted to start charging for that once you had adopted uh, any version later after Java 8. So our current 11.4 release is still using Java 8, so uh, we did not have to pay any license fee for that. But obviously, we need to keep up to date with our third-party platform support. And you have uh, this kind of branched world now where we're having to adopt the uh, what's called the Open JDK. So this is an open source fork. Um, with that version, of course, and the applets are all completely removed. So we are replacing the business rules with it, and we're going to offer a fee. So enhance it to uh, add some additional parameters, one of the key ones being to be able to specify a client and a project type when you're automatically creating projects through the business rules with it. The other, I think the most commonly used of the existing applets currently is uh, Explorer. And we took a slightly different approach with that. Rather than have it uh, rewritten in uh, some neutral uh, web technology, we've actually ported it to be a desktop application. And so it's a separate application that runs on the end user's desktop. And I'll show you uh, in a moment how that looks. Uh, again, we're consuming the latest version of the online editor that comes with some new find and replace functionality. There are some other capabilities in the pipeline for us for the online editor piece, but for 11.5, it will be find and replace as the new feature, and obviously some uh, defect fixes and other uh, refinements, performance improvements. And then obviously the, there's the other pieces that I talked about previously in the roadmap, TM usage and uh, customer defects, customer reported defects. So just to come back to that Java topic, so open JDK, it's not the Oracle Java version. Um, as you can see here, it allows support for third party Java runtime environments, i.e. Amazon Coretto. Uh, this is Amazon is one company who's picked up the open source uh, flavor of Java and are packaging it up and 
shipping it under their own branding and developing it in their own way. Um, interesting move by Oracle to seemingly fragment the, the market a little bit here. There are other players in there as well, so we're watching the space very carefully. But by adopting the open JDK uh, version 11 currently, but obviously we're going to stick to this version from now on, we kind of you know, liberate ourselves a little bit from the uh, decision making that Oracle has with its uh, business model for how to monetize Java better. Um, like I said, we are continue to watch this space and uh, see what other variations might come. But right now, I think we're in a very good place when, with 11.5 that will be, kind of, you know, like I said, uh, not tied by the decisions that they're making um, with how they want to monetize that platform. Again, the implication is there's zero possibility of running applets in that version or developing uh, applications that rely on applets. So we will be fully applet-free with 11.5. Um, business rules wizard uh, is the last one. We have changed the workflow editor, and Explorer will be running as a desktop app, as will the linkage editor, should you ever require that. The, the modern paradigm for creating projects doesn't require you to use that, but it's still there. And will also be a desktop application. So, some important kind of platform changes with 11.5. Obviously, they've had quite a number of implications. Uh, so, 11, the gap between 11.4 and 11.5 is relatively short. So, this is really one of the key changes that we're making, uh, along with adopting the other updated core components. So, here's an example of the old business rules wizard. It was rather wasteful of space. And the summary that you can see at the bottom is awfully cramped and difficult to read. And so our focus on not just redoing the old, but actually improving it uh, shows you here, uh, is shown here rather on, so here's your, on the left hand side of this uh, you know, configuration for your, the parameters for your business rule. And then on the right is a nice summary broken down. And so it, it's uh, some small improvements along the way. I think the, the key improvements here that we're delivering is not really about the presentation, although it's clearly better. Um, but about the additional parameters that we're able to offer to align the, uh, I guess, the functionality that business rules offer, the very rich functionality, with the way that we want people to be working, which is using project types and clients to create their projects and pick up their settings from there rather than relying on AIS properties. So here we are, a couple more examples. It's uh, Explorer now. When you run it, it pops up a login screen because you need to be able to connect to your world server instance. Uh, the good news is if you have more than one, a staging environment or uh, uh, and a production, then you can use the same applet to connect to both of them. Um, but that's, uh, I guess, a small gain. Um, but it, it's actually the usability of the uh, Explorer as an application rather than applet is actually much richer now. Um, there are some improvements we're making along the way here, certainly from a presentation perspective. But uh, it, I think that this was the uh, shortest cut and the best approach to delivering the rich and often used functionality that Explorer offers uh, outside of the now dead applet technology. So coming back to online editor, and I just want to focus a little bit on some of the features here. So this is really, uh, like I said, it's one of the uh, key pieces within that language cloud platform. It's also available in group share and TMS and world server, and we all get to benefit from the good things that the dedicated online editor team are delivering. Uh, and here's some examples. So uh, find and replace. We have download target files, and that's also coming 11.5 for uh, for world server integration. QA checks already there. Um, we won't have time, unfortunately, to integrate those fully in 11.5, but that will they will come early uh, next year. So when I come to the roadmap timeline, you'll see if we go from 11.5 to 12, but there will be intermediate releases where we leverage some of this functionality. Like I said, there is a clear commitment that we have to replace the existing Java platform by the end of this year, and that's the deadline that we have to meet, which meant that some of this functionality, unfortunately, we have to push out to releases in 2020, but uh, the functionality is there. It's simply a matter of integrating and testing and shipping, so uh, it should be available in short order. Slightly larger piece of work is terminology matching, and uh, there's a nice screenshot of that. So using terminology that we store in world server to other updates, present that to the 
translator or the reviewer in the online editor. Uh, and then online preview to come later. Again, that's the larger chunk of work to come. So we started, we have existing TM lookups. So this right-hand pane is where all the magic happens, as you'll see. So lookups include uh, translation memory, as you can see here. There's also the uh, TQA, so the quality model aligns with the quality assessment data that you can provide feedback on an existing translation. So these are already there in uh, the online editor integrator with World Server. QHX will be coming, as I said, uh, at some point early in 2020. Here you can see again, so we're reutilizing this pane to provide the feedback. Here you can see three different levels of the, you know, the error uh, warning and information that you'll be familiar with if you're using verification in Product Studio. And here you can see it again working here. So it will be interactive. So as you confirm a segment, it will run the configured QHX. You can also do it in a batch mode on a document. Um, and here you see uh, terminology matches. And not only do we have them available in the lookup pane, but they also feed into the auto suggest mechanism. So any term matches can be uh, just picked with one click from there as well. So those are the things to come uh, in the online editor. I just wanted to call out that as a, it has its own roadmap and uh, execution development team. Um, as we consume those components, we get a lot of the, those additional benefits and targeting the translator and the reviewer persona, not exactly for free, but we, you know, there's less work to do on the world server engineering team, which we can focus then more on other areas of the product. And some of those are in uh, world server 12. We're looking at some back-end re-architecture again. None of this is visible, the work, that, the busy work that goes on there, except that you will see the application perform faster and go wrong less frequently. So that's what scalability, performance, and robustness really means. Uh, we're kind of under uh, pinning again, uh, shoring up the uh, you know architecture that we have. So there's always work to do, especially with a mature product like World Server, where we can improve on some of the design choices that were made some years ago, which were right at the time, but things change and things improve, and progress says that we must keep up to date with those things. And certainly in the enterprise space, scalability and performance are obviously key factors in the success of the uh, ROI of implementing World Server. Feature enhancement, as I mentioned there, for translators and reviewers, so that uh, you know we're trying to address all of the personas here. The back-end re-architecture is really for administrators and system owners, translators and reviewers get much richer functionality in the online editor. Continued feature enhancements for the project managers and the dashboard, so it won't be quite as uh, all singing or dancing as the dashboard you saw in uh, language cloud designs, but there will be some uh, you know, effort put into presenting in a more uh, easily digestible visual graphical manner the status of individual projects and the overall flow of the aggregated projects that are currently in flight uh, in the system for that individual project manager. And um, removal of silver lights, so the, I think the last bit of UI baggage uh, that will be gone in World Server 12. Um, again, that's kind of a deprecated technology that we need to uh, move away from. And then the obviously customer satisfaction. So. Uh, looking at the ideas that are being posted on the ideas site there. I mean, I look through those uh, regularly. Once a month, we have a session where we review those. And so I'll be working through identifying some themes and putting together uh, some stories for the backlog, uh, directly addressing the customer requests. And then move the dial bug fixes, so anything that's highly impacting either one customer or is uh, an irritation, but spread across multiple customers, then we will address those as well. Quite often, we'll find that um, you know defects uh, might get escalated, and it's only affecting one customer, but it's a critical issue, so we must address it. That means often that some of the low and medium defects they get overlooked and they end up not being addressed. So, one of the things I'm doing now, working uh, with. Uh, the support team and the engineering team is figuring out which of these low-hanging fruit we can meaningfully address that will actually make a, a big difference, even if it's not something that's critical, the house is on fire kind of defect. So uh, that's really the areas of focus for uh, 12, like I said. Addressing each of the individual personas that we have in the, in the supply chain and hopefully offering some 
improvements, benefits, productivity gains, um, all of those things that the uh, roadmap is designed to deliver on. Uh, here's the timeline, so that we're coming to the end of the deck now. So Q4 this year, as I've said, there's a, a drop dead commitment that we must uh, ship the updated Java version with that uh, version. And then 12, I put here out into Q3 next year. That means that, like I said, between those dates, you will see in that we'll be able to deliver some of the additional value that we're getting from not only the work that we're doing for 12, but also uh, consuming the uh, other pieces of our uh, language platform, things the online editor, the updated file types report. For example, there are new file types coming in. We have Markdown and Photoshop and other things uh, coming in the pipeline, for example. And so I haven't called out all of the individual detail here, but there will be intermediate releases to deliver on those things. Okay, questions and answers. I see three questions already. Uh, I'll just address those, and if you have any more, please do enter them into the questions box. How long will the World Server Legacy UI remain a part of World Server? This is a very good question. Um, for the administrator persona, I think the management page will always look the way it does currently. There is, uh, since the, that's the smallest subset of user types that we have accessing those pages. There is the least amount of business value in adopting those, and it also happens to be the part of the product where it has the most pages. So uh, the key focus really is on the project management persona, and we've got the new project management uh, pages there. Um, there's still some work to do. As you saw, even 11.5, we're also improving, uh, closing some gaps and delivering some innovation in that area. So all of the new work goes on in the new UI, but uh, there are currently no plans to remove the legacy uh, project pages either. And you can choose the default to those if you wish. I would prefer it. They obviously, all customers adopt the new UI, but some uh, users I have expressed some resistance to doing that, uh, which I'm hopefully trying to whittle away uh, with individual conversations. But in general, the new UI now should be the default for all uh, upgraded uh, deployments. But there are no plans, there's no end of uh, life message for the legacy UI so far. Next question, does SDR have plans in Language Cloud to implement capacity planning, invoicing, pricing, resource, and vendor management? Uh, yes, all of those things. So there is already uh, invoicing, pricing, resource vendor management, all of those things. We couldn't ship at TMS without all of those things. Capacity planning is one of these kind of bigger roadmap items that's been bouncing around for a few years now. And the language cloud, uh, the development of the language cloud as the next generation platform has allowed us to go back to the drawing board with some of the designs and architecture of the application and be able to do things like this, which, you know, while possible in the existing product portfolio, were often a lot of work to retrofit something uh, onto the existing platform that wasn't designed in. Rest assured, all of those kind of things, those big ticket items that you may have been waiting for in roadmaps for other uh, products, they have featured and factored into the roadmap and design planning for uh, language cloud. So it gives us that much easier uh, step towards delivering on those long-standing uh, customer requests. So yes. Uh, there's, then there's a question, the next question is around terminology support in the online editor, which is an obstacle to adoption currently. Uh, hopefully I've addressed that, so that will be coming uh, in 2020 now, like I said. Uh, the idea of updating the online editor, we are doing that with 11.5, but for the specifically for that terminology, that there is an integration requirement that uh, requires work on both sides, so the world server side, to implement the technology, that's the terminology provider, and obviously then uh, online editor to be able to show those with the red overline and the uh, results in the lookup pane and feeding into the also suggest. So there's a little bit more work to do there, which is why that's pushed out into into next year. But indeed, uh, that is also uh, a commitment. 
If you're currently implementing 11.3, can we skip 11.4 and upgrade immediately to 11.5? Uh, is another question that's come in. Uh, you can do that, of course. Um, you're free to upgrade to 11.4 right now because we have actually 11.4.1. It was the first CU release, so that is the latest version. There is a, an 11.4.2 in the pipeline that will due to ship in a couple of weeks. Um, but if your upgrade process is a little bit uh, more drawn out um, than others, then you can indeed wait till 11.5. But I would prefer all of my customers to be on the latest version. I know that that's not always practicable, but uh, indeed there's no reason just to, if you have the capacity internally and the option to upgrade, then I would recommend 11.4 and then you can uh, upgrade to 11.5 when we ship that in some months. Uh, let me just see. I think that is all of the questions that we have. Uh, we've gone over a little longer than uh, these showcase webinars normally last, but I think there's a lot of information to share there, which I can summarize if there are no further questions. Uh, let me go back to the beginning. So uh, there is no end of life for the existing uh, product portfolio, including SDR World Server. There is a clearly defined roadmap for the next two years. Uh, there will be a roadmap extending beyond into 2021. It's just that it, it's a little bit far out now to provide anything meaningful there in terms of setting expectations, but the knowledge that you should go away, there, there is a roadmap into 2021 for World Server. Um, the language cloud is coming. It's actually about to be released in a couple of weeks, but it almost certainly is not ready for some of the uh, mature and extended implementations that you currently have with well-suited implementation uh, transition or migration requirement as yet. What I will say, though, is that all of the product managers who are responsible for the existing product portfolios individually uh, have all been tasked with understanding what that migration effort might be so that we can feed into the prioritization of features in the language cloud roadmap, as I mentioned earlier. So it's not that we're not thinking about it. We're doing a lot of thinking about it and anal analysis and understanding what it means to migrate. Uh, but there is no requirement to do that for the rest of this year and well into 2020, uh, and almost certainly beyond for many of you. Um, and so the, that is really the summary of the message. The, we continue on. SDR World Server is fully supported, has a roadmap. Your investment that you've made over the years is guaranteed, and uh, you should rest assured that when the time comes, if you're interested and able to, we will assist you in migrating to Language Cloud. If you choose not to, you can continue to derive business value from your existing World Server implementation. Uh, sorry, another question just come in here about customizations that were built in Java 8. Will they, uh, are they compatible with the OpenJDK 11 platform? The short answer is yes, they definitely should be, but obviously as part of the upgrade process, one of the things that we do and that we encourage others to do if they're not engaging with SDL, um, if you're managing your own upgrades on-premise, is to validate that those customizations will work. Typically, a recompile is the only thing that's necessary. If they rely on some feature that has been deprecated in the Java platform, then potentially they'll have work to do. But uh, typically, there is you know, zero to little effort in uh, porting those uh, customizations from one Java version to another. Okay, I Great, think thanks, I'll address Kate. all of the questions there. Yeah, back to you, Kate. Thank you. Okay, lovely. Thanks for presenting today, Ray, and thanks everyone for attending. Uh, the recording will be available shortly, and we'll make sure everyone gets a link to the recording.